Uh, hello, everybody out there in internet land. My name is Dr. Ben Bellarado. I'm the laboratory manager here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Cortez, Colorado. And I'm really excited to bring you this week's webinar with uh, our great archaeologist, Ryan Spittler. And uh, the pattern, uh, sorry, the title of his talk is uh, Patterns and Results of Large Scale Cultural Inventories in Southeastern Utah. So before we uh, have Ryan uh, take the lead, I want to go ahead and go over just some logistics of uh, the webinar series. So, you know, over the last year and a half, many of us uh, around the world have become quite accustomed to using the video conferencing program Zoom. But in case you haven't, I want to go over just a couple things that will hopefully enhance your viewing experience. So at least the way Zoom starts for me, um, we have the main screen you're looking at, and then usually in the in the upper right, as you're looking at the screen, you can see a bunch of talking heads. Now you'll probably see Ryan's head talking for most of the presentation, but you can actually move those around in case uh, uh, those blocks uh, with with the the persons you know the people talking are in the way. You can actually pick your cursor and put them on the top and move them around other parts of the screen in case there's something that 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 particular. Uh, video blocks covering up, and that should help you be able to see everything that Ryan's talking about. Also, there's a live transcription service, and you might be seeing that at the bottom of your screen now, basically translating everything I say as I say it, which is really interesting, really cool. Um, and if you have any you know, uh, trouble uh, hearing what Ryan is saying, this is a great way to uh, stay involved um, also, just so you know, it does have some troubles translating Native American place names or some of the jargon that archaeologists tend to use. So just be aware of that, but it is a very helpful service. Also, Ryan will be taking questions at the end of his presentation, but uh, along the way, if you have a question that comes up and you don't want to forget it, you can see this, this block here. Uh, my cursor is skimming on in black. There's a chat, raise hand, and Q&A button. So what you'll do is you can click on that Q&A and then type your question in. And so along uh, the process of Ryan's talk, basically Taylor Hasbrook, who's our webinar guru, sets all this stuff up. She and I will be compiling these questions and then we'll um, have a, a series we can ask Ryan at the end. And we definitely encourage you to ask things related to the presentation. If you want to say hi to Ryan or something like that, you can actually put that in the chat. Uh, this push this chat button, type it in there, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. If you're having difficulties seeing the live stream, you can also check out uh, the Facebook version of this, and that's really uh, nearly um, uh, identical in terms of the, uh, how this is, is, is streamed there. It's basically, I think, a couple second delay. So you can tune into uh, crowcanyon.org slash Facebook if you're having trouble, or you can also just view this, this webinar uh, there as well. And you can even type in questions and, and we'll see some of those as well. Uh, we also encourage you to like and subscribe to um, us on YouTube. And that helps us to unlock some additional functions that help in, in enhance the, your viewing experience even more. And then also this webinar will be uh, posted up on our, our YouTube uh, channel, uh, and that is, let's see, it's behind this text box, uh, crowcanyon.org slash YouTube. And then this webinar so will be posted there so you can watch Ryan talk about Southeast Utah again and again and again, or you can tune in to our previous webinars that are also all uh, listed up there as well. So we definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, so here at Crow Canyon, I want to tell you a little about what we do. Our, our mission uh, is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And here you can see a, a picture of our beautiful campus located in southwestern Colorado, just outside of the town of Cortez. And here you can see the famous Ute Mountain uh, in the background and our, our 170 acre campus in the foreground. We definitely encourage you to, to come visit us and sign up for some of our educational programs. You can also check us out at crowcanyon.org. So uh, 
We also like to, and find it's very important to acknowledge uh, in the last year or so, uh, land acknowledgements have really come into the fore and in all types of public presentations, both in archeology span and other types of uh, anthropology and, and, and social type of presentations. And so here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, we like to acknowledge uh, the Pueblo, the Ute, the Paiute, the Diné, also known as Navajo, and the Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which uh, we work and reside. So our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, the present, and the future. We respectfully recognize and honor uh, ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. And Crow Canyon is particularly grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. And, you know, one of the reasons we, we put these land acknowledgements uh, up and, we, and we, we talk about this is to really, you know, give us all a second to pause and, and really think about you know, the, the history of the land that we all live on, no matter where you are in North America, chances are you probably are living or working um, or as you walk your dog, you know, you're, you're on lands that once belonged to other people. And so we like to acknowledge uh, that and, and respectfully uh, um, think about that. So maybe think about that for a sec. Um, so <clears throat> with our archaeology webinar series here, you know, really, the viewers like you make a difference. Uh, and we'd like to uh, ask you to please consider a donation to the Crow Canyon Annual Fund when you register for a webinar. Uh, a Crow Canyon trustee has made a really generous $50,000 challenge match for 2021. So every dollar that you contribute uh, to in support of our Discover, Discover Archaeology series um, uh, will be matched up to $50,000. And so Taylor just gave me the updated version of this. And we're already up to uh, over $29,000 towards this, this $50,000 match. Uh, and that's going to help us to uh, continue to bring this webinar series uh, to everybody out in the internet land, internet land into the future. So please uh, consider a donation. Along those lines, we have a couple of really interesting webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and these are every Thursday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And next week is Scarlet Macaws, Long Distance Exchange and Placemaking in the Pre-Hispanic U.S. Southwest and Mexican Northwest with Dr. Christopher Schwartz. And I've, I've had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Schwartz a couple times, and he's doing this incredible work. Um, and so it's actually a really fascinating, probably really vibrant presentation uh, based on the subject matter there. And then the following week, we're uh, bringing a closer look at the big picture. Great House Community Dynamics at Aztec Ruin, Northwest uh, New Mexico with Lori Stevens Reed, sorry, Lori Stevens Reed, Aaron Adams, and uh, Jeffrey Warren. And that's uh, Thursday, July 22nd. And that should be really interesting. Uh, Lori, uh, in particular, was actually my first boss. I had my first internship with her, driving down from Durango to Farmington to look at uh, ancient pottery for uh, $3 an hour, I believe it was, but it was incredible uh, transforming experience. So that should be one for you as well. Um, and then finally, we want to, you know, over the last year, of course, year, year and a half now, actually, um, we've all had a really hard time. You know, things have been really strange and different and really difficult, of course, uh, because of the pandemic. But Indigenous communities have been hit particularly hard. And so uh, you can make a difference. And we invite you to uh, donate to some of these relief funds. So these are some of the official relief funds that, that um, we found. And there, of course, are others probably in your local area, but you can check these out when you uh, watch Ryan's talk again. So we have the Pueblo Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, the official Navajo Nation COVID-19 Relief Fund. So there's just a few of some of the great um, uh, organizations uh, you can donate to to help um, you know, help get us all back to normal. So um, then without further ado, um, uh, I'll talk about the, uh, just real briefly, um, some of the, um, what Ryan will be presenting to us. <clears throat> um, so 
Give me one second here. I seem to have lost my page. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, Ryan uh, Spittler has uh, been an archaeologist for a number of years. I mean, I'm sorry, Ryan, I actually can't find your, your bio uh, right this moment. Um, but I know Ryan has done incredible work in all four corner states and has uh, led crews throughout um, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah, and particularly has worked in southeastern Utah in the last um, uh, several years doing uh, some incredible work on the uh, federal lands to document and protect cultural resources. Uh, Ryan is uh, works for Woods Canyon Archaeological Center, and this evening he will be presenting <clears throat> patterns and results of large-scale cultural inventories in southeastern Utah. So, uh, without further ado, I'll turn this over to you, Ryan. Okay, thank you, Ben. Let's see if I can get my screen shared here. Okay. Perfect, we can see it. Okay, great. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, so um, as Ben said, I'm an archaeologist for Woods Canyon Archaeological Consultants here in Cortez, Colorado. And you know, I've worked uh, for Woods Canyon for the better part of the past seven years. Um, and more recently, um, over the past couple of years, I've had the, the privilege to do a lot of survey work um, in southeast Utah, particularly San Juan County, Utah. Um, and it, it's over this course of time that I've really developed uh, an interest in the ancestral Puebloan uh, occupations, kind of the, the Cedar Mesa area out there. Um, let's see here. So since 2015, um, Woods Canyon has uh, worked in San Juan County, Utah for the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the state of Utah, the United States Forest Service, and partnered with Friends of Cedar Mesa uh, to conduct archaeological survey work, uh, rock art documentation, and conservation uh, efforts at a number of sites. Um, so in this, in this time span from 2015 to 2020, we've, we've surveyed over 19,000 acres uh, re recorded over 1,800 uh, archaeological sites and uh, conducted various uh, conservation treatments at, at over 25 sites uh, so far. Um, this next map here uh, just kind of gives you a general overview of uh, Southeast Utah and all these kind of yellow squiggly lines and blocks that you see there are, are places that we've, we've, uh, we've worked in. And this kind of uh, red line near the bottom there is, um, is Road Canyon. Um, and the majority of this presentation will focus on some of the, the survey data we collected while working uh, throughout Road Canyon. Um, you know, we've, we've surveyed in places such as Cedar Mesa, um, the Indian Creek unit of Bears Ears National Monument, um, up and down Comb Ridge. Um, we've, uh, worked on conservation projects at sites like Moon House, uh, Monarch Cave, Cold Spring Cave, Turkey Pen, Shumway Cabin. Uh, we recently finished up a, a project over on uh, at River House along the, the San Juan River. And we currently have crews over at Lewis Lodge on uh, Forest Service land. Um, so these two sites here uh, relate a little more to uh, this presentation as they, they both are located uh, either along or within uh, Road Canyon. Um, the site on the top, um, the Citadel, uh, we worked at in 2016, and we actually used uh, three packets to haul off um, about 30 gallons of water for our conservation efforts. Um, there was a lot of uh, mortar work involved in the stabilization there and repairing some larger voids in the walls. And on the bottom there, uh, more recently, we teamed up with the Ancestral Lands Conservation Corps and Friends of Cedar Mesa to work on the Semakiva site. Um, and here we, uh, we stabilized to varying degrees um, all of the architectural features on the site, um, as well as um, 
conducting some, some formalized trail work, as you can see on that photo on, on the bottom left. And uh, one of the other things we did was um, some intensive uh, photo documentation and mapping of two of the most um, intact kivas on the site. And this photo here on the right is one of those kivas. Um, and additionally, um, 14 tree ring samples were taken from, from these kivas, uh, seven from each kiva. Um, and I'll touch upon uh, the results of that, those tree ring dates um, here in a little bit. So back in um, 2017, Woods Canyon was awarded a multi-year contract by the, the BLM Monticello Field Office. And uh, the, the, the first uh, phase of this project was to um, assess uh, a lot of visitor-related impacts by recreationalists um, around the Monticello Field Office. And we uh, surveyed the trails within North and South Mill Canyons uh, the Fish and Owl Canyon Loop Trail, and additionally, 10 other sites that saw heavy visitation. Um, the following year, we surveyed uh, about 75 miles of roads and uh, over 1,700 acres around popular camping areas, all of which were mostly on top of Cedar Mesa proper. And in, in the last and most recent phase of, of this project, which uh, finally wrapped in 2020 in the fieldwork, was done in fall of 2019, um, was, was serving the, uh, ex essentially the entire extent of, of road and line canyons. And, that, and that's the, you know, mainly focusing on the, the main visitor trails throughout those canyons. Um, and this presentation, like I said earlier, is, is generally gonna focus on some of that data collected from the surveys throughout uh, Road Canyon. So to give you an overview here, uh, Road Canyon is essentially on kind of the eastern flank of, of Cedar Mesa. And Cedar Mesa is this, is this large uh, landform that's um, bounded by Comb Ridge on the, on the east, uh, essentially Grand Gulch on the west, uh, Elk Ridge to the north, and it kind of overlooks the Valley of the Gods to the south. And all of the, the major drainages of Cedar Mesa end up flowing into the San Juan River, which is more or less directly to the south. And Road Canyon, you know, like I said, it spans um, near the, the crest of Cedar Mesa, all the way down to, to Comb Wash near a uh, large um, formation of Comb Ridge. And the canyon spans, uh, you know, almost 18 miles long, and it ranges in elevation from 6,300 to about 4,500 feet in elevation from, from the, the head to the mouth of the canyon. Um, much of the canyons dominated by Cedar Mesa sandstone, as you can see in this photo uh, there. Um, but by the time you get down to the lower stretches of the canyon, um, it, it starts to change into uh, what's called Halgado um, shale. So it, it kind of has a, a much different look um, the lower uh, you get down the canyon. Uh, vegetation in the canyons dominated by a pinion juniper uh, forest, you know, with some uh, sagebrush as well and uh, some stands of cottonwoods along the bottom. The uh, water throughout the canyon is really only available seasonally. And um, the only dependable water comes from a few springs and you know, maybe some larger uh, water pools from pour-offs throughout the canyon. So th this uh, kind of uh, graph here on the left, um, kind of gives you an overview of the ancestral Pueblo and occupation of uh, the Cedar Mesa area. Um, and this was largely uh, developed out of the Cedar Mesa project in the 1970s. Um, and there, there are some Palo Indian and archaic occupations along Cedar Mesa, but it's, it's fairly sparse. Um, and, and we don't quite see as much archeologically as some of these other um, periods through time. Um, the first really intensive occupation of Cedar Mesa uh, begins during the, the turkey pen phase of the Basque Maker II period, which, you know, spans from about 100 BC to AD 200. Um, and, and this is largely based off of uh, a highly stratified excavation unit in the turkey pen ruin in Grand Gulch. Um, following the turkey pen ruin, um, there is the Grand Gulch phase, which lasts from AD 200 to AD 400. And it's believed that most of the sites along the upper 
stretches of uh, Cedar Mesa uh, date to this phase. Um, so following the Grand Gulch period, there's a roughly 250 year hiatus uh, across Cedar Mesa. And, and what that means is uh, the populations seem to really uh, decline heavy enough um, where we're, we're, you know, we're just not seeing very many sites archeologically dating to that stretch of time. And populations of people come back at around 650 to 750 AD during the MOSFET phase of the Basque Maker III period. And yet again, after this uh, MOSFET phase, there is an even longer hiatus where, uh, which kind of goes through the, the Pueblo I and early Pueblo II periods. And people don't really start repopulating Cedar Mesa intensively again until about 1060 AD. And they're there until uh, no longer than about 1270 AD before they all, um, you know, all the people migrate off the Mesa. Um, and archaeologists have created uh, four separate phases to kind of understand the, the late Pueblo II and Pueblo III period, um, which are termed the Wingate, Clay Hills, Wooden II, and Red House phases. Um, there's also a, a, a possible 15 year hiatus between the Clay Hills and the Wooden Chew period. Now, following the, uh, the depopulation of Cedar Mesa at the end of the Pueblo III period, um, within the few hundred years after, uh, you know, some, there are a handful of uh, Ute, Navajo, and Paiute uh, peoples um, repopulated Cedar Mesa, but it wasn't until about the mid to late 1800s that. Um, European American folks um, were kind of using the, the Mesa as well. Um, and, and this chart here, um, particularly the Basque Maker II, Pueblo II, and Pueblo III period, will kind of be the framework um, throughout the, uh, the, the, the presentation. Um, so, to give you an idea of some of the results that we saw throughout uh, Road Canyon, um, before we started surveying, there were only five documented sites throughout the entire 18 mile stretch of the canyon. Um, we documented a total of 32 sites. Um, there are three additional sites that we did not document during this uh, survey project as they were located on state land or near the rim of the canyon, which we did not survey. Um, so currently there are a total of 35 documented sites throughout the canyon. Um, and 29 of those are recommended as eligible to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so out of those 35 sites, um, we were able to identify a total of 43 distinct um, temporal components. And those components are, are broken down the bottom left there. Uh, and, and the Pueblo II to three period is certainly sort of the most common um, component uh, that we're seeing. And it's, it's followed closely by Basque Meter II and, and three. And, and that kind of um, lines up to these, um, this general occupational history of Cedar Mesa fairly well in terms of numbers. Um, you know, there's, there's very little Pueblo I period sites that we saw. Um, and we, we only had one uh, historic Navajo site and one historic European American site. Um, in terms of site types or component types, um, habitations were by far the most common um, component type, so you know, residential type sites, um, followed by storage areas and rock art areas. Um, there was a much lesser amount of tool manufacturing areas, camps, or activity areas. Um, the sweat lodge that we found was related to the historic Navajo use of the canyon, and the trail slash route was related to the historic European American uh, use of the canyon. So what is the intention of my presentation? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm going to I try to identify aspects of these multi-component uh, occupations at Pueblo II and three sites in Road Canyon uh, in a more detailed manner, specifically um, in an attempt to refine their occupational histories. So essentially on, uh, during survey, uh, it, it can be difficult um, to parse out and further better define these sites in a more detailed manner rather than just uh, uh, stating that the site um, likely dates to the span of the Pueblo II and III period. So I, uh, I'm going to make an attempt to 
maybe refine that a bit um, throughout the presentation. Um, and, and I'll be identifying and refining the occupations by analyzing dismantled rooms, uh, rock art style, ceramic data, and treatment dates. Um, then I'll formulate some interpretations about the occupational history of these sites and compare them to others across the Cedar Mesa area. Um, and finally, I'll explore some avenues uh, for future research. Um, so there are currently a total of 12 known habitations throughout Road Canyon that date to this general Pueblo two to three period. Um, and there are, were four habitations that I'm going to be focusing on for this presentation. And they all share one thing in common. All four of these uh, habitation sites throughout Road Canyon all contain um, the, the remnants of, of what I'm going to refer to as dismantled rooms or mortar remnants. Um, and some archaeologists will call these ghost walls or ghost rooms, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll continue to um, call them dismantled rooms and mortar remnants throughout the, the presentation. And you can see on this, uh, this table here, um, so for all four of these sites, there are actually more dismantled rooms than there currently are standing rooms um, when you combine them all. Um, and you know, two of the sites have slightly less dismantled rooms compared to standing rooms, and two of them have slightly more dismantled rooms than standing rooms. Um, so what am I talking about when I'm talking about dismantled rooms or, or mortar rooms? Um, there are these, these really faint traces of uh, mortar outlines that are sometimes really hard to see. You know, the light needs to be right. You have to get down and, and kind of look up uh, above overhangs and alcoves um, to, to even be able to see them. Um, they can be pretty faint. Um, a lot of times, all you see are um, these kind of outlines of rooms, and there's really nothing else there besides that. Um, other times, there's a couple, uh, presumably uh, architectural stones directly below. Um, and yet, in other circumstances, newer rooms have been built on top of um, these uh, older rooms. And it's uh, sometimes uh, quite difficult to uh, you know, assign a date range to when these rooms were occupied. Um, in the cases where there are newer rooms directly uh, you know, built on top of these mortar remnant rooms, the only thing we can really say for certain is that these newer rooms are essentially newer and that the mortar remnant rooms predate these newer rooms. Uh, this, this site in particular has a contiguous uh, set of 10 dismantled rooms behind this set of three um, standing rooms. So there used to be a huge suite of rooms here um, and on the eastern side here where this arrow is, uh, there used to be this arcing a two-story dismantled room, which is, uh, you know, basically over three meters tall. So it would have been a pretty striking uh, site when, it's, when it was still there. Um, but all that remains now are these kind of faint streaks of where these rooms used to be. Um, there's a pretty interesting site um, in the head of uh, Lime Canyon where there's a, a total of 15 rooms um, that show the same pattern where you're getting just these faint outlines of rooms of the past, um, but there's no architectural stone, there's no pieces of wood or mortar chunks. Um, everything seems to have been cleaned up and nothing, they, they didn't rebuild rooms like they did in some of the other uh, road canyon sites. The, the photo on the top right is pretty interesting. It's that is actually the second story room. Um, and this little square rectangular shape in the corner there is uh, what I think of as maybe like a storage bin or some other type of little um, nook within the room. So there would have been a, you know, at least one or two other rooms below that that would have supported that upper room. Um, in terms of rock art um, on these sites, uh, you know. For whatever reason, we see a lot of, uh, of Basket Maker 2 imagery um, across these later Pueblo 2, Pueblo 3 sites. Um, these uh, anthropomorphs here likely date to the, the Basket Maker era. 
Um, this particular site um, is a pictograph panel. Um, and I chose to show you the drawings rather than the photos here because it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, there are you know, a handful of geometric or zigzag kind of lines, uh, plant-like imagery, bird-like figures. Um, and and the, the image in the middle is a, is a large uh, dart from that model um, that would have been thrown you know, essentially at like a sphere. Um, and, and what that tells us is that it, this panel probably dates um, earlier than uh, the Basque Maker III period when the bow and arrow was introduced. So this next site uh, was a pretty incredible panel. And, and this drawing really only shows about one fifth of the entire uh, extent of the panel. And it's a fairly large, long panel. Um, you know, I think it spanned um, upwards of you know, 20 meters. So you're talking 60, 70 feet long. Um, and it was maybe, you know, uh, easily uh, 12 to 15 feet high. Um, and there's easily over 100 different elements on this panel. Um, up on top, there are these two uh, large Basque Maker II, uh, almost life-size anthropomorphs that were traced of mud. Um, there's also, um, we counted over 20 uh, separate flute players on this panel, which are kind of interesting in its own right. Um, there's also a lot of Pueblo II and three style anthropomorphs and imagery on this panel as well. So you're kind of getting a lot of uh, superimposed and mixed um, time periods all within the same panel, um, which really is a testament to the complexity and the use of, of this particular site. Um, so ceramics, uh, archeologists uh, essentially um, have used uh, the study of ceramics on some of these sites to further define uh, the, the late Pueblo II and Pueblo III periods across Cedar Mesa. And what they found is that during the, the Clay Hills phase from uh, AD 1100 to 1150, it's traditionally dominated by Chianta tradition ceramics um, with a lesser extent of Mesa Verde tradition ceramics. Um, and during the subsequent Pueblo III period, during the wooden shoe phase from AD 1165 to 1210, and from the Red House phase from 1210 to 1270, it's almost exclusively Mesa Verde ceramics. And there's really very few Chianta ceramics. Uh, so much so that uh, one study found that 0.005% of sherds found at Red House sites um, uh, were of Chianta origin. And it's 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 important to note that the Cedar Mesa area is very much, uh, you know, the Western extent of the, the Mesa Verde culture region, um, which it, it borders with the Cayenta region, um, just to kind of the West and South. Um, so you do tend to get a, a bit of a mixture of these, these different ceramics or architectural styles um, within these sites. Um, so this was kind of my attempt to take a closer look at the ceramics in these sites to see if I could possibly uh, further define these sites or further break down the, the Pueblo II and Pueblo III period based on the ceramics. And unfortunately, a lot of these sites just really don't have a lot of uh, artifacts to begin with. And that's a product of these sites being located near the bottom of the canyon. Most of them are um, on sandstone, slick rock, um, and artifacts tend to wash into the bottom, throughout the bottom of the canyon. And a lot of these sites are fairly close to major trailheads. So I'm sure a lot of the painted uh, sherds have, uh, you know, walked away over the years. Um, there were two possible Moenkopi corrugated sherds that um, could be attributed to the Kanta tradition. Um, but with such a small sample size, I don't know how much you can really say about that. Um, in terms of triggering dates, uh, like I said earlier, we recently in, in the summer of 2020 took uh, 14 triggering samples from the Seven Kiva site. Um, but unfortunately, only one uh, triggering date came back, and that was a near cutting date of 1143. Um, and so that essentially means that that particular beam was cut um, probably within a couple of years of 1143. Um, which means it's, it's potentially during the late Pueblo II period. 
Um, this particular site uh, has traditionally been thought of as a uh, mid to late level three period site. So we're talking, you know, mid to late uh, 1200s. Um, so this beam uh, may be a little out of place, but maybe not. Um, it's really uh, telling us kind of maybe one of two things that this particular kiva is slightly earlier, which dates to the level two period, or it may have been um, stripped from some of these dismantled rooms that are also present on the site and reused during the Pueblo II period. Um, so let's take a look at, uh, at Moon House for a bit, because I'm sure at least some of you are at least uh, familiar about the site um, and may have even been there, um, but it, it tends to be a, a fairly good case study for what I'm talking about. Um, the Moon House site is, is often thought of as one of the last occupied sites on Cedar Mesa. And it was uh, completely abandoned by about AD 1270. There's a, uh, the most recent uh, tree ring date is from 1268. So it's fairly accepted that by 1270, most people had left the site. Uh, most of the standing architecture was, uh, is thought of to have been built from about AD 1226 to 1268. And that's largely based on, on numerous tree ring dates that have been collected from the site. However, there are uh, numerous earlier occupations on the site, which I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, there are actually some Basque Maker II um, rock art style presence on the site. Um, back in the 70s, uh, I presume during the, the Cedar Mesa project, uh, about 1,600 ceramic sherds and 800 lithic artifacts were surface collected from the site. They're currently being held at Washington State University. Um, and, and these ceramics tell us that, that there are occupations dating to the Basque Maker III period, the late Pueblo II period, as well as the Pueblo III period. Um, additionally, there are a handful of uh, ceramics from the Pueblo I and early Pueblo II period, but these are often seen as um, extremely short-term um, occupations or use of the site. Um, but what about the architecture? Um, is there anything architecturally on this site um, that may suggest an earlier occupation rather than uh, you know, the, the heavy occupation from about the 1220s to the 1260s? So out of the over 100 tree ring dates at Moon House, there are only two cutting dates um, that are uh, from the late Pueblo II period, which date, both date to 1143, which is the late Pueblo II period. Um, and in terms of uh, mortar remnants um, on this site or, or other architectural debris um, that may uh, give clues to any earlier occupations, there are um, at least two um, areas on the site on the east and west, um, but, but these are traditionally have been thought of as remodeling events probably during the uh, AD 12, 1240s. Um, so the, the signs of earlier architecture, when you're just looking at the architecture at Moon House, are, seem to be much less recognizable. Um, and you really have to uh, take a look at uh, you know, the ceramic assemblage and earlier rock art styles to really understand that the, the total occupational history of, of this site. Um, there was a, a master's thesis um, by Melanie Bedell of Washington State University, which was put out in 2000, and she analyzed uh, 24 Pueblo two and three period sites um, throughout Grand Gulch, which is essentially west of Road Canyon, um, kind of on the western edge of Cedar Mesa. And she looked at 175 rooms, 34 of which were habitation rooms, 21 were kivas, and 120 were storage structures. She did mention that there were several mortar remnant structures noted, you know, similar to the ones uh, we've seen throughout Road Canyon and elsewhere, um, but she, she didn't include them in her study because there was no real good way to, to give a solid date to these mortar remnant structures. However, she did find a cluster of tree ring dates between 1112 and 1146, which is the late Pueblo II period. And additionally, um, from a, a cluster around uh, 1240s to 1250s during the late Pueblo III period. So she briefly mentions that these mortar remnant structures 
potentially may represent late level two period rooms that appear to have been uh, dismantled, um, presumably during the late level three period. Um, so it's made me wonder, could this, uh, you know, have, have also occurred at these sites in Road Canyon um, in, in elsewhere? Um, so where am I going with all this? Um, or there's um, really two main things that are happening here um, that I've touched upon. Um, you know, most of the Pueblo two and three habitations, at least in, in Road Canyon, have a complex uh, occupational history and they have a lot of evidence of earlier occupation. Um, some of the, uh, additionally, some of the Pueblo two to three period habitations also contain numerous remains of those previous rooms, um, those dismantled mortar remnant rooms. And so, you know, why are people occupying these same spaces almost over almost a thousand year span? Um, and I'm certainly, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to have the answer for you for that uh, this evening, or I may never. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly I'll, uh, throw out some some ideas. Um, you know, um, the simple answer is uh, you know once a good, la good location, always a good location. Um, these habitations are are typically in pretty well protected areas, um, in alcoves or large overhangs. They are fairly close to reliable water sources. Um, it's possible that there were environmental influences throughout uh, the occupational periods of Cedar Mesa that may have made these spaces more favorable to uh, the people living out there. Um, or it, it could relate to more of a direct connection with the past or to uh, those who came before, um, the, the ancestors. Um, so in, in terms of um, these these dismantled or mortar remnant rooms. Um, it, it really seems like in most of these cases that these rooms were purposely dismantled and, um, and almost cleaned up. Um, and it's generally more so than weathering alone, I think, in many of these cases, um, where you don't, you don't see uh, direct water streak marks that may have destroyed these rooms. Um, you're not seeing the, the other remains of the rooms directly below. Where they used to be, um, and it made me think. You know, this, this is a lot of effort to dismantle these rooms, rather than potentially repair or model what was already there and, and kind of build off of that. Um, so it, it start. It seems to me to be a little less practical and, and potentially more, more of a cultural thing going on. Um, and certainly, some of these uh, rooms, you know, they're the functions of the rooms themselves, or the functions of the site, of the, these sites themselves, may have changed over time. And that could really relate, um, you know, to these dismantling of these rooms. Um, so this kind of brings me back to these these four uh, these four phases of the late Pueblo II and Pueblo III period. And um, the one interesting thing um, and that we know is that during the Clay Hills phase of the late Pueblo II period, from about 1100 to 1150. Um, it's fairly dominated by Kianta ceramics. Um, and following that, um, we, we really don't see as many Kianta ceramics in, in the assemblages when we get into the public three periods um, of these sites. Um, and Life and Glowacki have even um, suggested that the reasoning for these Kianta ceramics during the, the, the Clay Hills phase um, may be attributed to population movement from the south or a shift in pottery procurement from the resident population. Um, so I started thinking that maybe these dismantled rooms um, could typically date to um, the late Pueblo II period. And essentially you have something happening in terms of population shifts or even a change in social identity where the new folks moving in during the Pueblo III period um, have chosen to um, redefine themselves or dismantle these previous rooms and construct new ones. Um, but I think there is certainly a potential connection between um, the uh, Kianta ceramics here and um, some of these dismantled rooms during the late Pueblo II period. Um, and this is certainly supported by what uh, Melanie Fidel has uh, stated in her thesis. Um, 
you know, she's having these clustering of uh, triggering dates uh, between the late Pueblo II period and uh, the late Pueblo III period. Um, and essentially, um, this, this may uh, be attributed to the ship from a heavy use of Kansas ceramics to uh, Mesa Verde ceramics. I mean, it may have something to do with the dismantling of these rooms where there's um, something going on um, culturally in terms of identity um, with the folks living out there. Um, you know, I think it's something uh, worth exploring a bit more. Um, so to summarize, um, the earlier components uh, of these Pueblo II and III sites um, can often be overlooked um, and a bit less understood, um, basically because the later occupants of these sites um, have basically remodeled or uh, obliterated some of the, the, the earlier components. Um, and I think what this really does is it gives us sort of a biased understanding of the earlier components on these on these sites. Um, but ultimately, um, where I'm going is that these uh, dismantled rooms, uh, you know, they may correlate to the ship from uh, the Chianti use of ceramics to Mesa Verde ceramics during the late Pueblo II to, to the Pueblo III period. And, uh, you know, I believe it, it, it may have something to do with a social or cultural uh, change or a, a shift in, in populations that is um, attributed to this. Um, so where do we go from here? What um, tree ring dating, there, you know, there's only one tree ring date uh, that I know of um, that we took throughout all of Road Canyon. Um, and there's certainly tons and tons of datable good wood. Um, these are just a few examples of mostly intact roofs um, from some of these sites throughout Road Canyon. Um, the preservation out there is, is pretty spectacular. Um, but uh, we don't have those uh, tree ring samples as of yet. Um, I certainly think that some more infield artifact analysis would benefit um, the uh, further definition of these Pueblo two and three sites. Um, there uh, definitely needs to be ethnographic research with descendant populations. Um, we could always use more survey coverage in the Sierra Mesa area. Um, so little of that area has um, even been systematically uh, uh, surveyed and very little of the sites have even been documented. Um, I think that more in-depth architectural documentation may be worthwhile where we could possibly parse out some more trends throughout the Pueblo two and three period in terms of architectural styles. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, it's worthwhile to start paying attention to some of the parts of these sites that are just a little bit less obvious when we're out there. Um, so to circle back a little bit, the original purpose of, of this project of, through Road Canyon um, was to you know, assess uh, well, was to document um, cultural resources and assess impacts from recreationalists or visitors um, coming to these sites. Um, and we definitely found a lot of visitor impacts. Um, there were a few instances of graffiti on these sites, um, evidence of people trampling um, uh, parts of the sites, whether it be intentional or not. We had a few instances of folks uh, camping in sites, uh, you know, starting campfires within sites, or even um, creating collector piles where they're picking up, uh, you know, large quantities of artifacts and just leaving them all in a pile. So we really aren't quite sure where they came from. Um, but ultimately, I think about 50% uh, of the, the sites we documented would definitely benefit from some type of conservation treatment. Um, so just kind of a friendly reminder, um, while you're out visiting sites like this in, in the Four Corners region, um, leave all artifacts where you find them. Uh, don't touch your damn and draw cart writing. Steer clear of the walls, you know, don't step or climb over walls, you know, don't even enter rooms. Um, leave, in, leave the grinding um, in the past. Historic artifacts aren't trash. Can't be needed away from cultural sites. Um, so before I uh, finish, I'd just like to 
uh, thank the Bureau of Land Management, Monticello Field Office um, for uh, giving me permission to give this presentation and um, in the state of Utah as well for for including um, some sites um, on some of the, their lands that they manage out there. Uh, thanks to Friends of Cedar Mesa and all of their employees um, that we've uh, worked cooperatively with uh, over the years. Um, thank you to Crow Canyon Archaeological Center for putting on this webinar. And uh, special thanks to all of my um, coworkers here at Woods Canyon, archaeological consultants, um, Definitely, especially Daniel Hampson, who spent you know several weeks with me trekking through uh, those canyons out there on Secret Mesa. So just a uh, thank you to uh, everybody involved. Great! Well, thank you so much, Ryan. That's, that's a great presentation. It's amazing work that you guys are doing out there. Um, so yeah, so we have uh, a number of questions that have that have started to roll in, and some that came throughout the process. Um, uh, and so, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out where is the best place to start. Um, one of them uh, comes uh, in terms of some of the just the methods that you guys use, um, and maybe you can just elaborate on some of those. You know, do you create drawings of the sites yourself and um, do they have to be drawn to scale or are they more of a visual reference? Can you maybe go talk a little bit about the process that you, uh, you go through? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the, the survey through um, Road and Lime Canyons um, were essentially focused on the existing visitor trails and any spur trails that led to um, obvious archeological sites in the canyon. Um, and we essentially would survey, you know, either a 15 or 30 meter corridor around these trails, um, looking to identify archaeological sites. And when we, um, what, you know, when we stumbled upon a site, um, yeah, what, uh, we, we end up doing a number of things. We um, somewhat intensively photo document um, all of the architectural or features of the site. Um, we write up a uh, official uh, site form that goes to the state, um, in this case, the state of Utah and the Bureau of Land Management. Um, we also, yes, create a to scale uh, drawing or map of the site. Um, and a lot of times, um, you know, we're, we're, we're coming to the age where we're able to do this with uh, GPS technology. Um, but because we're um, in these pretty deep canyons, uh, GPS devices don't really want to cooperate that well. So we ended up, um, you know, going back uh, old school and, and doing more kind of paper and compass and pacing style uh, drawings of these sites um, and then drafting them when you get back to the office. Um, and we're also, um, you know, kind of giving a, uh, a tally of, of different kinds of artifacts that we're seeing on the site because it can tell us uh, various different things about the use of the site. Oh uh, yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a great synopsis of, of how the process works. Um, so uh, there was a couple questions concerning these dismantled rooms, which is really interesting. You know, having worked out there myself, I know that's those are always back there, and you don't know what to do with them. So I think that's great that the, the um, interpretation that you've you've uh, started to form of those. Um, but one question was, uh, you know, are there evidence of seeps or springs um, that either you know have dried up or that you know. Uh, maybe we're available to some people, but not to later folks in some of those sites, or have you made, been able to make any type of inferences that way? Um, did you say seeds or grains? No, no, sorry, seeps or springs. Oh, seeps or springs. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain right now on those, uh, those particular sites I was covering. Um, you know, in terms of seeps, uh, I can't necessarily recall on those sites that there was a, a direct seep um, really in any of those uh, alcoves, um, unless they, you know, they may have been pretty dried up by the time we were there. Um, but I do recall at least at uh, 
at least at two, two of those sites, they were pretty short walking distance from some really large pools of water, which I assume uh, generally have water all year round. Um, and, you know, some of those are, are actually probably fed from uh, seeps as well. They're just probably not directly in those sites. Oh, interesting, interesting. Um, so then we also have some questions about um, uh, tree ring dating and the, the tree um, uh, just construction with, with timbers. Um, in your experience out there, you know, what are most of the, the timbers made of? Like what kind of trees? Um, you know, you can have anything from pinion, juniper, uh, cottonwood, which I believe traditionally doesn't date very well. Um, and, and I think that's one reason why when we took 14 samples from those kivas, a lot of it came back as cottonwood, which really doesn't produce uh, any viable dates. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the time, um, you know, depending on the quality of those beams, you know, they could be rotted um, to a certain extent. So you, you may not be getting the whole span of tree rings from, from start to finish. So it, it just kind of depends. Gotcha. Um, and then, so um, let's see here. So concerning wood dates, um, you know, I know that Tom Wines and myself and then some of the other work that you've looked at, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, work at Moon House by Alstrom and, and the like and, and Bloomer, but um, have you been able to uh, get a, a good comprehensive data set of all the different tree ring samples that have been, been taken previously in other parts of Cedar Mesa compared to? Yeah, I have not. I've, I've actually looked at a what I think is a, probably a somewhat comprehensive list of uh, triering groups throughout the Cedar Mesa area, but I haven't um, had the time um, to really sit down and try to parse out that data. But you know, I think it I think it would be um, pretty interesting to look at, and um, I'm I'm willing to bet that that there are similar trends that uh, you know, certain clusterings of dates uh, potentially during the late Pueblo II and, and late Pueblo II period. Um, and, and take that, um, you know, whatever that means, like take that uh, for what you will. But uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's something I've definitely thought about and uh, um, I think it's worthwhile to look into. Oh, great, great, great. Um, let's see here. Um, we have two questions about uh, mud related things. Um, so one of them is about mortar and, uh, uh, and the other one's about mud ball. So let's just, let's just talk about mortar real quick. So um, do you know uh, with your and, and Woods Canyon or other folks work out there that uh, are there any analysis of mortar remains um, that, that, you know, how do we use that as archaeologists or um, uh, what can you tell us about studying mortar? Um, so I can tell you this, um, during a lot of the, the conservation work that we do, um, we do our very best to, to match that prehistoric mortar um, within a, a particular wall or um, in, in even a room. In, in any given room can even have multiple um, different colors or types of mortar that were applied to it. Um, so we, we really try to match that prehistoric fabric. Um, and one of the ways we do that is um, we generally go um, within a short distance off the site and we'll, we'll take soil samples um, from around the area. And uh, I, I don't recall the, the particular name of the process, but essentially what you do is you, you put a soil sample in a jar and fill it with water, kind of shake it up, and then let it settle for a long while. And what will end up happening is you get uh, ratios of silt, clay, and sand within that within that uh, source, um, and you can actually take some samples of prehistoric mortar and do a similar thing, and get that that ratio of silt, clay, and sand, and, and try to do your best to see what matches best. Um, you know, and in terms of color, we we tend to use what's called the the Munsell, uh, color chart to try to do our best to match colors. Um, 
But I think uh, more often than not, um, these mortars are, 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 aren't traveling great distances. They're, they're mining their mortars probably fairly close to, to the sites themselves. Um, and after doing some, con some conservation work myself, um, re-mortaring walls, it takes a lot of mortar or a lot of dirt and a lot of water and a lot of work to, to build these walls, believe me. Um, so I, I don't think you would necessarily uh, prefer to go long distances to, to gather, uh, you know, a quote unquote optimal mortar. Oh, that's great. Um, so then the other question you had related to mud um, and mortar is um, that one, uh, one viewer noticed on your rock art uh, map, uh, notice the presence of mud balls above the upper panel. And she wants to know, are mud balls common at petroglyphs, uh, petroglyph sites in this area? Yeah, um, you know, they are, they are fairly common. Um, and I was just talking to a coworker about this the other day. Um, we were kind of having a debate about what we thought these mud balls could have been. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know that anybody clearly knows um, potentially what they are. You know, there's some thoughts that people think that maybe they're throwing them up there to, to test out the mortar. You know, if it sticks, it's a good mortar. It's kind of like throwing a piece of spaghetti on your ceiling. And if it sticks, it's good. Um, but maybe that's just my present day uh, analogy that I'm using there. Um, I don't know. It could just simply be that, that they're, they're just having fun. They're just playing a game. Like, who can throw a mud ball the highest or who can hit this target on the wall? I don't know. I mean, people in the past, I'm sure, had fun too and they played games. So it could be as simple as that. I, I, I don't know. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's important. We remember these people that lived there were people like us in a lot of ways. You know, they had fun with their families and their friends and, and their brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, we, we often forget that about the past uh, and, and forget about the humanity of these places. But um, so another question came in about, um, you, you mentioned briefly the, the youth occupation in the area. And uh, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that just a little bit in terms of what types of sites uh, that you find that you attribute to uh, the youth occupation of, of, across Cedar Mesa or specifically in this, the areas you talked about. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, traditionally, we, uh, you know, I could think of a handful of sites um, kind of in the Cedar Mesa area that I've come across and documented. Um, and it's a type of structure that we call wiki ups. Um, and then, uh, you know, nowadays what those look like are um, a handful of axe butt uh, logs that um, maybe leaned up against a tree or may have fallen over. And they would have used these as kind of temporary structures. Um, there's also um, what's called a peeled pines. Um, and I've seen these on, you know, more often than not on ponderosas, um, but also on pinions. Um, and they're, they're kind of taking uh, uh, a, a chunk out of the, the bark of the tree. Um, and, and I believe what they're going after, there's a substance on the inner bark that is kind of sweet tasting. And um, they're they're kind of using that as a, either a medicine or um, even as a food in some circumstances. Um, and it's even possible that, that some of those strips uh, could even have been used as uh, for making cradle boards as well. Um, but I think a lot of times, um, yeah, out of most of the youth sites that we find, um, really don't see a whole lot of artifacts um, related to these sites. Um, seems like they're, you know, whatever they're using at the time, they're maybe taking with them and, or reusing. They're not leaving much behind. You know, maybe if you're lucky, you'll, you'll find some, uh, you know, flight lithics or something like that, but more times than not, no, not very many artifacts. Uh, you really have to have a good eye and have, um, 
have a lot of uh, reference material you can look at, but then also experience in terms of knowing what to look for. So that's uh, that's that's really uh, fascinating that you, you guys have been able to identify those. Um, so uh, one question then relates to kind of your interface uh, with the public. So you know, having since you spent a lot of time out there. Um, one, you know, did you encounter many folks from the general public visiting these sites while you were doing your work? And, um, you know, just from your experiences, are the people, if you did encounter any, are they fairly knowledgeable about sites and site visitation ethics? Or do you have to do a lot of visitor education while you're there? Or, you know, how do you go about that? Um, kind of a mixed bag, I guess, in terms of uh, seeing people, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, generally, the further you get away from the trailhead, the less people you're going to see. Um, and then you might see more like backpackers uh, the further afield you get. Um, but certainly, um, sites that are within, uh, you know, a few miles from the trailheads. Um, and there are definitely more visitors going to those sites. And yeah, I, I mean, I can think of uh, a handful of, of sites that we've been stabilizing. So we're, you know, we're at these sites, uh, you know, nearly all day um, and coming across visitors. Uh, and, and, you know, not everybody, you know, has um, the knowledge of uh, proper site etiquette. Um, so yes, there is some, um, I, I suppose, educating um, visitors about um, where to walk or how to walk through a site or, or if, if it's even appropriate um, to walk uh, on or through uh, particular sites. Um, because depending on the site itself, it, it just walking on it could, could potentially um, disturb those archaeological uh, deposits. Well, then that leads into uh, one more question. I don't want to keep you for too long, but um, you know, people are definitely very interested. Uh, when you kind of touched on this a little bit in terms of stabilizing, uh, and stabilization efforts you guys have been making. And so, you know, one question was, uh, what's involved with stabilizing an archaeological site? If you just give us a, you know, a brief summary of how, how you go about that. Sure. Um, so generally, uh, we'll, we'll generally start out with what's been called a condition assessment of the site, um, where we'll have a, we have a conservator uh, on, on staff that, that leads a, a crew out to a site. And they essentially go one by one um, throughout the site to each um, kind of architectural unit or uh, each feature within, on the site. Um, and they'll kind of give a, a detailed write-up about the current state of, you know, say a particular room or wall. Um, and, and some things that could potentially uh, be impacting that wall, whether it be uh, water runoff that is eroding the mortar, um, whether it be uh, visitors walking up to a wall and kind of undercutting um, the soil around the bases of it. Um, there could be a whole variety of different um, um, issues um, that are going on with some of these sites. Um, and essentially what happens is we create a report um, and depending on who we're working for, generally when we work for um, these federal land managing agencies. Um, at that point, they review our report, um, send it off to consultation with uh, various uh, tribes around the area uh, to get their input about the work. Um, and, and then the, the next step is actually um, making repairs. And we aren't necessarily, we're never really uh, building more, I, I'd say, than what is there. Um, we're, we're not making assumptions about if, if an entire wall is missing, we're not reconstructing the wall. Um, maybe sometimes if there is a, a hole uh, in the wall that is compromising the uh, structural integrity of the wall, we may patch the hole um, to make that wall stand, uh, you know, hopefully for another couple hundred years. Um, so, and a, a lot of the materials that we use, uh, we do our best to to use all natural uh, materials. So not using, uh, typically not using anything like concrete or metal to support any of these things and trying to figure out ways um, to use, um, you know, similar materials that uh, 
uh, that these people would have used, um, you know, almost a thousand years ago. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's that's kind of kind of what happens. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> we had a question about um, uh, mittens and trash piles. Um, so this particular person, I uh, was wondering, you know, let's see if I could kind of summarize this well. Is you know, how do how do we think of what do we think of mittens as archaeologists and, and working out in Cedar Mesa? Are they just full of trash, or are there other more nuanced or even complex ways to think about um, deposition of, of discarded materials? Um, and uh, are they, yeah, is it just you know mundane trash, or is there something more more complex to that? Um, yeah, so I think you know, in a modern sense, uh, labeling it as trash, like sure, I, I guess, um, but uh, there, there's certainly a lot of data. Um, that can be gained from linden deposits, especially um, in some of these multi-component sites. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've certainly excavated a handful of middens. You know, where you you have features that are uh, within the midden. You know, some like pit features or um, potentially uh, uh, other things like that. Um, but you know. Um, I, I think from a more indigenous standpoint, um, uh, you know, it, it's not necessarily trash. It's, uh, they're, they're, it's more that these materials are kind of cycling through and they're going back to the earth. Um, it's maybe not the same way that, that we view trash in a, in a modern sense, uh, I, I suppose. No, that's great. That's, that's a great response. Um, yeah, I've heard the same, similar types of things as well. And uh, I think that can be something to think about. It's not just trash deposits. It's uh, yeah, you know, something that's maybe uh, more meaningful as well um, from, from a scientific and indigenous perspectives. Uh, so I guess, you know, maybe the last question I'll, I'll throw at you because I don't want to keep you too long is, um, you know, what are your thoughts on you know, why was there so much occupation in this this Cedar Mesa area uh, for such a long period of time? You know, what drew people there from your perspective, having worked out there a lot and, and been in the area a lot? You know, what what's the big deal? Um, you know, I think for any of us that have been out there, um, you know, it's it's a pretty um, spectacular place. You know, it's just the the canyons themselves, the landscape, um, it's, uh, you know, at a aesthetic value, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, um, you know, these, and, it, you know, it is, it is a high desert. Um, so, you know, we tend to think of it as desert environments being pretty harsh, but, uh, you know, it, these folks were pretty adaptable um, and, you know, they, they, they didn't just survive out there, they thrived out there um, for hundreds of years. Um, and yeah, I don't know, uh, it's, uh, it's they, they certainly had a connection to the land um, in a way that, you know, maybe we won't be able to fully understand, but uh, I think part of it is it's just uh, almost the natural beauty of, of that landscape. Um, it's, it's certainly a special, special place. Right. No, I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, well, uh, I think then we'll, we'll wrap it up for this evening. But again, I, I want to thank you, uh, Ryan Spiller. Thank you so much for your great presentation. It's really informative and uh, really well done. And you really, you know, are doing a great job uh, out there. And you and folks with Canyon, and we all think so uh, here at Grow Canyon. And um, you know, thanks for all the work you're doing. And uh, thanks for you know, helping to take care of this place we all care about so much. Um, but then also thanks again to uh, Crow Canyon and to the Bureau of Land Management and all these other federal agencies that allowed Ryan to give this great presentation. And uh, thank you all for tuning in this evening. And please tune in again next week. Thank you very much and good night.